Hi, everybody. This is Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars that started during the pandemic. And because you are so interested in all of the topics that we're covering, we continue to offer these webinars. You can find all of them on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And just remember to subscribe to the MurdochMethod.com newsletter. Just go to MurdochMethod.com and put in your email address. We put out a newsletter every Sunday that lists the guests for the following week. Um, we will be taking a break uh, in September when I go on safari to Africa. So, um, but we're going to have guests through August, as far as I know. And so we'll, you'll be able to like catch up during the time when I'm gone. Tonight, my guest is Dr. Raquel Butler. She's one of our favorite people and she's uh, agreed to come back and join us for another webinar. So welcome, Dr. Butler. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. Thanks so much for having me. It's always, um, yeah, great to be on your webinars. Yeah. Um, so uh, just for those people who may not know who you are, can you just give us a little ticky tour of your background? Yep. Um, so I'm a uh, veterinarian first. Um, been a veterinarian for 15, oh, 17 years. <laughs> it's the same age as my cat. Um, so yeah, been a veterinarian for 17 years. I've done um, a lot of therapy. So muscle release therapy is where I started. And then I've done um, a grad dip in biomechanical medicine. So osteopathy, chiropractic and rehab. Um, taught clinics in anatomy and biomechanics, done a lot of dissections with um, Sharon May Davis. And I teach at the uni now um, at Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga, <laughs> um, teaching in equine science. Uh, so I teach locomotion and disease and um, injury and rehab and the equine athlete. So that's a summary <laughs> of I've done a lot of other courses and um, yeah, lots of other kind of things, but that's a summary of my background. Awesome. It's always great to have you. So tonight we're going to talk about foals and the importance of body work with foals. Yeah. 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 So I'll just share my screen. I've got a little presentation. And of course, if anybody has any questions for Dr. Butler, please put it in the chat or the Q&A. And then where I see it's appropriate, I'll ask her those questions. So feel free to put your questions in that chat. Okay, so can you see my- Yeah. Full screen? Yep. All right, I'm just gonna get my video so I can see you. All right, so yeah, today talking about the importance of body work in foals and young horses and, um, yeah, this is an area that, A, it really interests me. Um, B, it always amazes me in the, in the changes that we can create. Um, and I just think it's so, so important to set a horse up for the foundation of their life um, through, you know, recognising any issues that they might have when they're younger and, um, you know, looking for the most balanced place that we can get their body into. So um, I recently just got a young horse. She's 18 months old and I haven't had a young horse before. So it's a huge new learning curve for me. But I met her when she was born. So this is um, little Ellie Mae in the image here of when she was a foal. And um, I treated her when she was a foal and she actually had a really good body. But we'll talk about things that have happened to her since that point. Um, and, and discuss that. So, um, oops, it didn't move. So yeah, the, the question is why should we treat foals and young horses? And really just to break it down to like one reason is symmetry. And, you know, I think if we set up a horse in symmetry, then we set them up for a lot of other, um, uh, positive things in their life. Like if a horse is symmetrical, they are in balance, they're generally relaxed, they're able to respond to their environment um, and they're able to move their body, you know, in, in ways that we ask them. So we're not going to get those overreactions that we, we can get. Um, there's a lot of sort of studies that have discussed asymmetry in horses and I'm not going to go into that because that's a whole, you know, topic on of its own talking about asymmetry and I'm sure that you would have had people mm -hmm. discuss that throughout the time um, but what we want to do is reduce that asymmetry from an early age 
so that we have a flow on effect of like uh, reducing behavioral problems because a symmetrical horse, uh, you know, as I said, will be able to respond better. Um, we wanna reduce the strain on the joints and, and as they're growing, reduce the chance of arthritis due to asymmetry, um, reduce saddle fit issues. Like we know with saddle fit, it can be very difficult to fit asymmetrical horses. So if we can target these while the horse is growing, we have a much better chance of that not being a problem. Um, and the best thing is you get quicker training because the horse is able to respond better. You get lower training costs. You get less vet bills because they're, you know, generally able to respond better, happier horses, happier horse owner relationships. And, you know, it's, it's really a win-win um, all round. So that's kind of the uh, one reason, uh, one main reason. The other reason is safety. Um, and, you know, what I recognise when working with, with the young horses that I've worked with in treating them is that when their body is not right, um, and this could be from an injury or from just restrictions, they are more reactive and they can't respond appropriately. So therefore, you know, we can end up with a horse that's rearing or we can end up with um, a, a horse that's pulling back or, you know, getting stepped on or kicked or, or any of those things just because they can't tell their body what to do properly. Um, and I noticed that a lot. So some of it comes down to learning and I understand, you know, it comes down to training as well. And they've got to learn how to respond to humans and all of that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, when Ali Mae first arrived, she, she reared um, a few times and, and okay, I'm learning, she's learning all of that. But it's interesting because as her body has got better, um, she's able to move instead of rear. Mm. So she can then have a different response. So when she gets confused, um, she can move out of the way instead of feel the need, like I've only got one place to go and that's up because I don't know how to move my legs. And she was very blocked through her chest and her shoulders. So for her to move quickly and respond to me if if that was what was needed like she couldn't do it so but she could go up um so and I've seen that in adult horses as well where you know they're giving us bad behavior because they can't physically do what we're asking them to do another aspect of that is is a shying horse um and uh I think any crooked horse you know they are more prone to shying um because again they can't look and see and and um, respond to their environment in that way. And I noticed that with Patch, like she was an older horse, but she would shy a lot. But as her body got better, she her shying reduced. And as she was able to look around and, and got more confident and trust in me, she, didn't, she never, never shied anymore. So, so, so this is really interesting because I, you know, I never, I mean, I used to handle foals in Kentucky and that sort of thing, but I never thought about the association between the pattern of movement and the horse being stuck as it, so it's its only choice, it's the only thing it can do because it doesn't have other choices available. Yeah, yeah, and I think we don't, it's not something that you just think about, like you automatically think, oh, like this horse is, that's what it does. Or, yeah, it's just playing up it. or that's its, yeah. that's its reaction to things as opposed to it's the only reaction it has as an option. Yeah, and then and then that, that reaction can end really badly. If, yes, you but know. holes <laughs> flipping over. I mean, how yeah. often does that happen? And they crash and burn. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, if they flip over, then that's it. That's, it's bad. <laughs> like. Yeah. You know, one flip over can really change their whole life. Um, and, you know, and, and I've been interested in watching that process myself because obviously that's the way I think. But the fact that she stopped doing that when, in my opinion, her body was better was, was really interesting because that's what I've seen with other horses. I've, I dealt with a horse uh, 
what was it last? I think it was the year before actually had a nerve injury and he was about the same age as Ellie Mae. And he would, he was a cult and a big, strong cult. And he had, a, he had like paralysis in his forelimb. So he'd lost that ability to control that limb. And I watched him and everyone was like, he's, you know, being naughty. But then I watched him, he, he had no control over that limb. That was, that's the worst thing you can do yeah. is, you know, for a horse to be growing and strong. And then all of a sudden, like he can't control that. So he would be quite naughty. And when we recognised that his naughtiness is actually a result of when he felt out of control and or perhaps when it was painful for him, then when when myself and the owner adapted to that, his whole behaviour changed because uh-huh. we could say, oh, he's getting tired, we need to put him away now. Um, or he's just doing that because it's painful rather than him just being a cult. Right. So that that was a really interesting process um, to go through with, with him and watch his behaviour change. Wow. But this... Okay, keep going, because otherwise I'll ask you with questions at this point. <laughs> okay. So um, today I'm going to discuss, like, obviously foals and some of the influences on what could cause um, problems with them. And then we'll talk about some common traumas in young horses. And I know I've probably left, I, I'm even thinking now of, of some I've left out, um, signs that we can look out for. And then pivotal times of treatment um, within their growth kind of stage. So one thing um, that has been talked about a bit and um, Dr. Ian Bidstrup is the uh, person who talks about this a lot. He's a colleague of mine and and a mentor and um, he's done a fair bit of research looking into the effects of birth trauma and understanding it. And he treats a lot of foals um, as well. And so one of the things that occurs is, you know, just in the process of normal birthing, um, you've got to think, you've got to, I've got an image coming up, but, you know, you've got a foal <laughs> squeezing through a pelvis that is not the same, same shape as the foal. Um, and we'll look at that in a minute. So that process, the birthing process, um, dystochia, so if the foal has had a difficult birthing process and, you um, you know, perhaps they've been pulled um, or it's been delayed or there's been some stress um, that's going to influence the way, you know, that that foal's body comes into the world. Um, mere confirmation and posture, I really don't think this is considered enough at all. Um, I've seen some pretty horrendous bodies on mares <laughs> that, you know, are being asked to produce foals and sometimes they're surrogate mares. So people are like, oh, it's just, you know, it's just a surrogate. But that mare could have like, maybe they even had a fractured pelvis at some point that you didn't know about or, you know, just sacroiliac wear and tear and damage um, that obviously we know the ligaments soften um, in the birthing process, but a a horse that's got damage in there is not going to soften in the same way as a horse that, doesn't um and so i really think that we need to look at the mare's pelvic especially conformation um and posture and think about you know how that affects the foal coming through because it can really be sitting on very different angles depending on their pelvic angles um and and their hoof balance and their fascial tension as well is also going to have a big influence on pelvic conformation so you know, um, the equine documentalist like Yogi, he talks a lot about negative palmer angles and, um, well, and how that's influencing the pelvis and, you know, trying to get the research to kind of prove that relationship because I think that's really important in the mare as well. So if you have bad feet, then that's going to affect that conformation of the, of the pelvis um, and old posture of the pelvis is probably what I should say. Um, the other thing is, has the mare had any injuries, you know, pelvic injuries um, or other injuries that have caused asymmetry in the body? That just often they'll go, oh, the mare's had a, um, you know, a traumatic injury that can't be worked anymore. We'll breathe from it. 
Mm-hmm. So you're breeding, you know, maybe from a mare that for six months didn't weight bear that well on a leg. And so you want to try to correct some of those imbalances in the mare um, before you put them in foal. Um, and one of my colleague, colleagues' friends, I, every new mare she gets, we always treat uh, and we check, like, from a bodywork perspective. Um, obviously, they Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is many, many years ago, but when I worked at a vet clinic in Kentucky, we would get dummy foals, what they call dummy foals. Now, that's yeah. back in the, in the 80s. So I don't, we never had a better name for it at the clinic yeah. when I was there. Is that a birthing thing? And what is it? Do we know? Um, it's probably not my like particular area of forte in terms of like the reproduction, but from what I know about it, it's usually a lack of oxygen um, and to the brain. And so it can be from a stressful birthing process or a delay in the birthing process, or it could be that they're premature. So there could be multiple influencing factors with that. Um, sometimes I think it can be that the birthing process is, is um, too quick and so they don't get the same amount of squeezing um, as they come through because that squeezing is really important for nerve reflexes and I know they say that in human babies as well, like a baby that comes through the um, birth canal you know, that squeezing is really important for, for development. So sometimes they'll wrap those folds in a certain way to mimic that again. Right. And that can, like, help them. Okay. So, yeah, I think there's multiple reasons that you can get it, but it's often an oxygen related yeah. to oxygen deprivation. Back then, all we did was pump them full of DMSO. Yeah, and I don't think they do that anymore. Good. <laughs> um, no, they. I think they have a lot better... Um, options to treat yeah. them these days and they do use that kind of I can't remember what it's called now um but they do use that kind of wrap where they mimic that birthing process again and that's becoming more popular and has been found to help as well great okay thanks um, so um but mare nutrition and mare stress is also going to influence the fall and I'll talk a little bit more um I think I'll talk about that again And we have Um, a question from Emma. She says, "Um, have you seen many foals that have been too big for the mare, the breed of a large horse to a small mare? Um, She's come across two that seem to have been stuck in position in utero due to the size comparison with the mare. Uh, Have you come across that very often? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a problem in any breeding. Um, And obviously that if it's a bigger foal, then they have more potential to to have dystopias and problems. So yeah, I think that is a, a problem. And then it comes down to the mare confirmation as well with that foal coming through. Yeah. So, you know, um, and if someone breeds a, yeah, a riding pony to a thoroughbred, like you've got to keep that in mind. I mean, that happens a lot, but you've just got to keep, keep it in mind. And it also depends how much and this comes down to nutrition and stuff as well, because if the mare's really overweight, that will also influence the, the, the room for the fold to come through. Um, and I did a few carvings in my time as a vet. So I saw like big calves in little cows that weren't meant to be pregnant yet. And like it was a, it was a real problem. So, um, and often, you know, those ones can end uh, badly. Right. So if we think about the foal, the birthing process, and we think about like why could this, you know, lead to its own issues? It's just a natural process, right? But the thing is that the foal doesn't come together. So when they come out the birth canal, they don't come with their front feet together and everything like symmetrically just pops out there. So they'll generally have their right front foot a bit forward and then as they... um, as they come out, they'll twist and kind of come out sideways. Um, and so as the, if you look at this shape here of the, um, the pelvic canal, it's not that big. Mm-hmm. And it obviously it does expand because the ligaments can expand, but it depends on any damage. Um, 
and they uh, they have to kind of come through to, like to optimize that distance they have to kind of come through on the side that's how they're going to have the most distance rather than coming straight down the middle right um there's also talk about like the large intestinal the right cecum position and whether that influences the way the so the folds come down the pelvic canal um so you know there's quite a discussion around the influences on fold presentation um but what we generally see, so the widest part of the fall is the chest and just underneath the scapula and, and the pelvis. And so those two areas are going to be the areas that get squished the most as, as they come through. So the right um, thoracic spine kind of gets crushed and the right tubercoxy gets more pushed down. Um, so most of them will come through with their left uh, down on the left rib cage lower. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they get crushed on this side. Yeah. Because everything kind of gets pushed down. Um, and so uh, they'll get rib fractures. And the problem with rib fractures is they're not always picked up. Yeah. Um, and so it's not always obvious that a foal has a rib fracture. To the foal, when it's born, it's just normal, you know, like, the neurological system is setting as, you know, the fall comes out and then they put their first steps and that's the programming of that neurological system at that time um, of like, this is how life is and this is my interaction with the ground and this is my interaction with gravity and the legs and all of that. So then the, the fall's body recognises this as, as almost a normal state and then the body's learning in this normal state which is actually an abnormal state, if that makes sense, because we've got fractures and things, right. problems in there. Um, so have, the, they done a, oh, yeah. have they done a study on the number of full, the average number of foals that have a broken, broken ribs when they come through? Yes. Um, and I think and I have it. And my other, and so the right front presents first in the majority of cases of births. Yeah, this is fascinating because you know. Um, so I. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So what I have here is that there's twenty percent have major rib cage upsets. Wow. That's that's major rib cage upsets. Um, the problem is that eighty percent are missed on radiographs, and they can also be missed on ultrasounds. So. The, and the other thing is um, in one study I read, like uh, it can be at the costochondral junction, some of the damage too. So therefore that's a really difficult area to, um, to image yeah. because of the cartilage interface. Um, and the other thing is a lot of the fractures occur between T3 and T8, which is underneath the scapula. So that's also a really difficult area to diagnose. Um, I guess unless we're going to put the whole fold through a CT, <laughs> that would be optimal perhaps. But then you got to, you still, everything is so um, like uh, ligamentous and stuff. I'm not even sure CT would pick up some of the soft yeah, tissue. So it's not like a fracture in an adult hard bone, it, but it, because it's so much softer, but it's still a fracture. Yeah. And sometimes in severe cases, the fractures can you know, um, perforate the lungs and be, be that bad. Like, obviously, in that bad, you're going to know about it. Yeah. Um, and even, so, even foals with severely fractured ribs can act normally within two days of birth. So it's, they're, they're not going to stand around and, um, you know, be like, oh, I've got fractured ribs. They're like, I need to survive. I need to move. I need to drink um, this pain state is a normal state for me. So this is just life. <laughs> That's what I have to deal with. Um, so you can't just say the foal's going to show you a behavior that you're going to know it has fractured ribs. But what I'm always looking for is how closed is their chest? Um, and how do their scapulas sit onto their chest? Mm -hmm. And does everything kind of look a bit like bunched? And like they say, you know, they do open and that's a natural process of the opening, but I'm always looking, does it look symmetrical? Like, 
Are they closed symmetrically? Are they opening symmetrically? Um, what does their neck look like setting into the body? So does it, do they kind of look like they're doing this? Or, you know, is it, do they have a nice kind of neck set going into their body? Um, the, uh, what else have I got there? Yeah, so they will, if you, if you palpate them, they will show painful areas. So they can almost, they show like a girthiness and um, because of the wither damage and the, the thoracic um, vertebrae damage. So they'll be like reactive in the wither area um, through that kind of saddle area, really. Um, they could be reactive in the lower neck and they also might be a bit unecked. Um, so I've got some pictures of that. So they can be like getting really spasmy um, in their neck. Um, they all, might also react in their flank, in their caudal rib cage. And you also want to look at their pelvis and see, you know, does that look symmetrical? So just looking at um, the points of their pelvis, their tubercoxy, and like how their sacrum sitting, how their tail sitting, and just seeing like, does that look symmetrical? And also, do they look like they're like tucking under because um, I've treated quite a few with pelvic like imbalances as well. And they'll often be quite reactive. Like one follow treated, if I touched it back there, it would kind of bounce <laughs> around. And then once that became more comfortable, it didn't bounce around when you touched its bum. So people think, oh, it's so cute. It's like it bounces every time you touch its bum. Well, and that's, you know, as I'm listening to you, my thought is, how is someone who's inexperienced going to tell the difference between just a full twitchy reaction, which they have, right? Yeah. And a pain reaction. And it sounds to me like what's important is to have someone look at your foal that's seen enough foals to be able to know the difference. Yeah, definitely. And then you will learn to, you know, recognize the difference yourself. And I think there's a lot to be said about just the power of observation, like, you know, looking at your foals a bit differently from now on and just, just looking at them and going, well, do those scapulars look symmetrical? Does its pelvis look symmetrical? Like, does it always react when I touch this place? Do my other foals do that? Like, it's hard if you've only got one foal. Right, right. But if you're, if you're breeding, then you can compare foals and you will have that experience of, of, how different foals have looked, but you didn't recognize maybe why they looked that way. Right. And, and in my mind, everything should always look balanced. So if it doesn't look balanced, if, it, if you think it doesn't look in proportion, then there's probably something wrong. Um, so by, if these aren't treated, then by one month, they can be starting to show the changes in the right hand side. And by six months, you'll start to see the changes in the hooves um, and they'll still have this pain through the right side. Now, obviously not all foals are presented this way. So we're just looking at, I think it's 60%, um, I think it was 60% that uh, have the same, yeah, 60% have this same pattern, but then there'll be 40% that have a different pattern. You know, they, they come down in the opposite way, for example. Right. Or, or some other, you know, they've had some other, they come out in some other weird way. Um, and what we want to think about also is that obviously if there's rib trauma or pelvic trauma, um, then we've had an influence on the spinal cord. And so, you know, having that influence on the spinal cord itself means that the whole neurological system is not working um, in balance. And so you really want to balance that up as soon as you can. So I talked about some of the factors um, in terms of nutrition and stress and, um, and you know, body issues within the mare. Um, other risk factors that will make it worse for the foals are obviously if they don't present well. So if there's a male presentation, so you've got like one leg instead of two or, um, you know, the head's been twisted back or the coming bum first, which is not good. Mm. Um, if they've had an assisted delivery. So the key is um, reduce the stress as much as possible on the mares. Try not to refine, refine, no, that's not the word. Restrain them in a bowling box. Like the, the more 
more space that they have, the better as well for a more kind of natural birthing process. Um, don't pull unless, you know, know your signs. And this is, that's not my area, like that's um, Cheney's area, but like know your signs of problems so that you can address those. But then when everything is looking normal, stand, like, don't be there. Don't, don't be in the mare's face all the time because that's having an influence on it. Um, so you want the process to just occur with the least amount of intervention possible. Made a mess, you know, they can be more of a risk factor um, depending on their age, depending um, if they've had any previous injuries. I mean, you've got a lot of maiden mares that are, have raced, so they're going to have asymmetry in their pelvis. And we don't know the connection between um, I don't, as far as I'm aware, there hasn't been a study done, say, looking at thoroughbreds that have raced in one direction and the, and the, the foals' bodies. So that sort of um, information is not available as far as I'm aware. Right. Um, and then there's the same, a lack of studies with looking at, you know, mere disproportion, mere trauma um, and how that's affecting the foals. Um, but this one was interesting. So this was a study that was a 17-year-old thoroughbred mare um, and they had a dystochia. So it was a 40-minute dystochia and the foal had maladjustment syndrome. So like it was a dummy foal due to, due to the um, delay in the birthing process. Um, but, yeah, what they found with this foal is that it had a sacral fracture. Wow. Wow. Um, and so that's the image that you can see there. So this foal was euthanized. Um, but, yeah, this was a study that I kind of found talking about pelvic injuries in foals. So um, why that occurred, like, with, I don't know the details of the dystochia, but, you know, this is something that we need to consider. You, you bring up a point, again, it's probably not necessarily straight on with this topic, but one of the things you said is leave the mayor alone yeah um, and you know does that also include leave the mayor and the phone full alone after the birth so that the mayor can bond to the foal? yeah I mean I think in all situations the least intervention is always best obviously you know you you have to check certain things with the foal um, make sure they're suckling fine and make sure that they're navel is fine make sure they pass their meconium um, you might have to check their um, immunoglobulin levels like there are certain things that you want to check but the longer that you can like leave them to their own devices and let that foal's body and I'm going to come at it from a body work perspective like rather than you know even from a bonding perspective but letting that foal's body learn about its environment like that's really important, in, especially in those early stages. Like we know that being a prey animal, they have to get up and go pretty quickly. Like a foal should be on its feet within 30 minutes. So, um, or often within, hang on, what is it? Within, yeah, within 30 minutes. So um, you're gonna, you wanna know the signs to look out for that it's not all normal but you want to try to keep as much at a distance as possible to allow the neurological system to process the whole process properly. That and makes sense? Yes, absolutely. In other words, it, you know, the, that foal is designed to get up and run. And the, the more we allow nature to take its course and the mare to do the, the job it's designed to do, the better off we are, the better off that foal is going to be. And in particular, that also brings me to the point of, you know, so often foals are kept in boxes. Yes. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a whole, that's a whole problem on its own as well. Like, um, you know, we talk about just for normal musculoskeletal development, how important that movement is. Um, and from a young, very young age, and especially for like your tendons and ligaments and and your reflexes and things to develop, um, they need to move and they're designed to move straight away. Um, and so keeping them in boxes is um, detrimental to their musculoskeletal 
health. The only time that you will keep them in boxes is if you've got a, you know, severe deformity, so a congenital like flexor tendon contraction or, or something like that where the movement on a really imbalanced body is not going to be good. And so, you know, um, we want everything to be gentle and soft when they come out. So we have them in really deep bedding. A lot of times, at least here, it's straw. But then what's happening to that foot when it's not on uh, an earth surface, if you will, for lack yeah. of a Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that that loading onto a, a firm surface is going to have so much influence on the proprioceptors, that neurological feedback, um, the fascial system, um, the, yeah, neural development. Like, I, I think that's so, so important. And I, and I, yeah, I'm not sure that people have really thought about the influence of that. Yeah, because, I mean, if we look at horses in the wild, often they're on desert, you know, at least in this country, out yeah. west, it's hard ground, right? So yeah. that foot is getting a very different uh, level of, you know, because of surefoot, I think about this stuff all the time now. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, but they get a very, but, you know, so many of the thoroughbreds are born on straw, and at least they were when I was working in Kentucky. And, you know, they'll keep them overnight on that straw instead of like immediately getting them out onto a harder surface and that foot. So talk about that full foot a little bit because it's so fascinating. Oh, did I take you somewhere? But it just, yeah. it's soft and then it gets, you know, it's soft and it has those like- um, Yeah, I don't, I don't have a picture of that. Um, yeah, it, it um, I can't remember what that's called now, but it has like those little um, like tentacles Almost. Yeah, maybe a little yeah, you know what they're called. Pop it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I just can't think of what, what it's called. But yeah, they have those little soft, um, little soft feet that you know, as they interact, they they be, go into a hoof. I think we just call it a foal shoe. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I think, and it's so soft, um, and so that. I mean, yeah, you think about you you want a soft thing hitting a soft surface, you're not gonna get mm -mm. that feedback happening. You, you, you're not gonna get the same development of that foot, whether it slows it, whether it changes the way they then load. Like, I don't think we know um, this information, but like you said, in a, in a natural environment, they'd be born onto most of the time a firmer surface and a variable surface. You yeah. know, so, and, and in, in a natural environment, they also are going to be moving that day, potentially. And so they're going to do kilometres uh, of moving on variable terrain. They maybe even do some trotting, like, you know, that yeah. they're not going to, they're not going to move much, but compared to putting them in a box, they're going to move a lot. Right. And, you know, and so one of how does that influence everything? Well, it just brought up, you know, so often we use the Mustang foot or the horse that's in its natural environment foot as our sort of baseline foot. But I just realized that baseline foot is born completely different than our, if you will, hothouse flowers that are born yeah. in boxes on straw. And so yes. right from birth, that foot is going to be a completely different foot than what we see. And, you know, I, we can't answer this question, but how much of the foot that we see, especially in thoroughbreds, has to do with what that foot, when it's born, is on? Yeah, There's yeah, and I think that's that a really interesting question. Like, yeah, um, and I think that's just a whole, <laughs> it opens a whole other well, can of thing. I know, it's like, uh-oh, I just went in another. Yeah, but I'd never because I probably that, haven't. You know? thought about that that much either because I haven't been involved in you know the birthing down of a lot of horses so I, I don't see the environments that they're born into a lot um, but yeah I think we often make it cushy for the mare you know to lay down right which is good but then we've got to consider yeah what does that fall stand on in the first 24 hours A emma's like open the can this is awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> a rabbit hole of amazing potential research 
Yeah, but, yeah, because we're always referring back to the Mustang foot, but it's born completely different. Yep. And how much more does it load in even the first 24 hours? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> you've got all of the proprioceptors and, you know, all of the neural pathways are establishing. I think in the first week, it's one of the most important times, you know, in terms of that neural development. And Emma probably knows more about this because I know she knows a lot more about embryology. Yeah. But, um, you know, we've got all of those pathways establishing in potentially... Yeah, not a good environment. Yeah, and even when they turn, well, in Kentucky, you know, it's limestone and it's grass. So, and there's no rocks in the field. It's not like they're on a hard surface. They're on a, on a kind of a cushy, if you will, surface at most of those places, you know, unless of course mm -hmm. we have a drought or something, but it's not like a desert environment surface, a hard surface. Yeah, like they're not getting that variability in the surface. Right, right. So, I mean, um, this comes back to then how we can, um, you know, well, how can we make that difference if, if, you know, we're breeding our own foals or our own horses. And I think, um, you know, having, having somewhere that you can move a foal on a variable surface would be a great thing to have in your environment, yeah. you know, so um, you can take the mare for walks as well. Yeah. So, you know, once they're, depending on the mare, the stress and, you know, but as the foal's developing, promoting movement is probably one of the best things that we can do. Um, and, you know, in, in exercise physiology, we talk about the importance of that movement in bone development, for example, let alone hoof development um, and, and tendons as well, because they change the most in the first 12 months of age. So how how that body is loading in that first 12 months. Like we just think, oh, just leave the foal in the paddock and, um, you know, until they're really ready to be broken in or whatever. But actually we could set them up so much better by uh, moving them, having options for them to move, treating them, um, correcting any asymmetries is really going to change the outcome of that horse's life. Right. Wow. All right. Okay. So um, I might just talk about the next slide first and then just come, just remind me to go back to ulcers because I think this one just follows on a bit better from what we've been talking about. Okay. So um, this is talking more about your developmental orthopedic diseases. So, you know, the problems that occur within foals developmentally. Um, and they did an 18 month study with 1,711 horses and they found that 11.3% required, required treatment for um, some kind of orthopedic disease. Greater than 50% of those treated recovered and um, about 677 showed evidence of some developmental orthopedic disease. So when we're talking about those, we're talking about things like OCD, um, so that's uh, a disorder of the cartilage, subchondral cysts, which are cysts in the bone underneath the cartilage, um, angular limb deformities, um, which you can see in an image here, fasciitis, which is uh, inflammation of the growth plates, um, your flexural deformities, so where you've got your contracted tendons, um, and your cuboidal bone abnormalities, which is in the hock and the carpus where they've got an abnormal shaped um, bone. And obviously that those things, that's very difficult to change because that's the bone shape. Um, OCD, uh, a lot of that has come back to nutrition of, of I think the mare as well as the foal and controlling that plane of nutrition. I mean, you could do a whole like, um, a whole presentation on each one of these like yeah. that's you know that's not I'm not here to kind of talk about all these today I'm here to talk about the importance of why we want to treat them yeah. and these are some reasons why um so uh and subchondral cysts it can be loading it can just be um developmental so but I guess the question is what can we do about it um and uh with OCD and subchondral cysts you're probably going to see um, some degree of lameness as they progress. Um, 
With fasciitis, so if, yeah, they've been on too high a plane of nutrition, the growth plates can become inflamed. Uh, but I also had a horse years ago um, that was, how old was she? 12 months old, I think. Um, and I treated her from a foal, so I knew her body and I knew that she was quite well conformed and I was quite happy with her as a foal. She didn't have um, any kind of major issues. Um, at 12 months old, all of a sudden she roached in her back and her owner said, can you look at her? Like she, she just doesn't look right. And I looked at her and she roached and she was so painful in her stifles. And I said, well, like, what happened? And for weeks, the owner was like, I don't know. Anyway, I think it's about the third treatment. I'm like, something must have happened. Like, this foal was fine. And then she's like, oh, my God. I led her out with the older horses and they chased her, like, really chased her. And she said, I couldn't get her out quick enough. But she was twisting and turning and... um yeah, it was probably after that. And so you think about a horse, a young horse's stifles at 12 months of age, the growth plates haven't closed, nowhere near it, and they're twisting on those growth plates. So about six, what was it, six? It was quite a while later that I convinced her to do an X-ray and we X-rayed it and the, the vet said, oh, it's fine, there's nothing wrong. But when you looked at her growth plates, she had little... Um, like osteophytes, little bits of bony growth coming out from her growth plates. And so um, what, yeah, what I think happened is she twisted, the, she damaged the growth plates. And so, so she altered her growth forever at that moment. And although we were able to get her more comfortable and relieve her um, roach back, her growth pattern was changed. Um, she has gone on to be a ridden horse. Um, but, yeah, people will probably say, oh, like, it's a confirmational thing that she has a roach back. But I can tell you that as a foal, she had a perfect back. There was nothing, nothing wrong there. So we want them to move, but we don't want them to, you know, be moving in a state of stress because that can stress the growth plates if they're doing a lot of twisting and turning. Um, but also fasciitis can just occur from a high plane of, of nutrition and when there's inflammation of the growth plates that is going to alter the way that those growth plates grow and close um, this little foal here is a friend of mine was a friend of mine's foal and um, was born with uh, angular limb deformity um, and then this is a few months later so she's a therapist and she did um, uh, I think mostly muscle release therapy on the foal it had a few trims but not not heaps um, and she locked it up a bit but not not as much so this just responded with body work nice. um, no taping um, no nothing and and the horse straightened up no veterinary intervention um, in this case um, so, um, oh, oh sorry yeah um, no um, Emma was just asking uh, in regard to uh, fasciitis um, the feed mix, like we think there's, when we're talking about feeding, if we have too high, you're talking about too high a plane of nutrition. And I think the way I interpret that is like either too much protein or too much carbs, yeah. Or, right? Yeah. That you, you get growth faster than what the body can handle. Yeah. Um, and then that could cause fasciitis because it's, it's outgrowing itself, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we see some of these foals that are huge. I mean, some of that is going to be, it's like people, um, you know, when you go to like, um, when I went to Cheats and Itza, I was a tall person and then the U.S. basketball team women arrived and I was a short. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so nutrition plays such a role. And again, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I, how much of the, the kinds of things that you've listed here could be attributed to the nutrition, uh, a nutritional cause, I guess is the question. Yeah, I think, um, I think quite a bit can be attributed to a nutritional cause. Um, I think with OCD, um, they have, I know there have been some studies looking at the nutrition of 
the foals and I think the mares. Uh, they do talk about protein content. And I think there is some talk about copper and um, mm. zinc as well. So, and, and just having appropriate calcium, phosphorus, um, magnesium balance for bone growth too. So, but I think a lot of it came back to, yeah, just being fed basically too much protein, like too much, too high plane of nutrition. So like what you kind of, what you said, um, they're growing quicker than they should be. And so we, what we don't want is fat, fat growing horses. Right. So the most important thing is to keep your horse, not, not like skinny, but to keep them in a good body condition score as they're growing. A, you're reducing the stress on their joints as they're growing, but um, which is probably a contributor to some of these things. Um, and also the mare to not keep them in a in an overweight condition either, because I I and again I haven't looked this up, but I'm I think that um, Jamie has talked about and maybe even in cows I remember as well. You know, like um, when the when the mare is overweight, obviously there's less room for the foal in general, and so flexural deformities and things are more likely too. So it's it's always keeping everything at a nice healthy weight. Um, making sure that they have the minerals and stuff that they need. Right. Um, and juvenile osteoarthritis was another one in that in that list. And so, if you know you have had a horse that's had septic arthritis um, or anything of of that um, nature, you're really going to have to think about looking after those joints because that developmental stage is so important for the cartilage specifically. So the other thing we want to think about is um, the the growth plates, and you know, so we just want to think about um, when we can have the most influence on the horse. And so, you know, the growth plates are where the bones grow from, um, and this is from uh, Sharon May Davis. And so, we when we're looking at lower limbs, they're kind of closing around one and a half to two and a half years if we're looking up to the carpus. Um, and then, you know, we're looking up to the vertebral bones for up to six. But what we're talking here about is the young horse. So in the young horse, and we'll say a young horse is less than two to three. Um, and in that young horse, all of the uh, upper body bones are still growing. So if we can set that upper body up in the most symmetrical, balanced way, then when the bones set, they're going to set in the best possible way. Um, and the same with the carpus, like um, if we can have the limbs as straight as possible. So um, by the time that carpus is kind of closing, then you're going to have much better knees for life. So when, yeah, when we talk about the growth plates, it's really just thinking about you know, this is probably one of the most important times in the horse's life that we could be treating them. And it's often, you know, a time in the horse's life that we're not treating them. Right. That's, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not around foals anymore, but, you know, the idea of treating foals and young horses so that they're balanced makes so much sense. And yet it's not even an idea that, at least in my experience of working with foals, that, that ever occurred. But, you know, I... Yep. Uh, quite a few years ago, yeah. now they're paying more attention. Um, I don't want to open another can of worms, uh, but just the idea of low weight bearing on some of these horses during the, you know, those up to three years um, and what kind of damage that we could be doing there. Yeah, um, I think like it is important for bone development that they are loading um and so you know um i don't think it's it's not the loading that's the problem it's the type of loading that we put and the length of time that we're loading them for you know so short bouts of higher intensity loading is really good for the bones and so um that's not the problem the problem is that when we're overloading you know so when we talk about a short bout, we're talking, you know, about 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes maximum, um, as opposed to, you know, 
half an hour of higher intensity loading. So we want the bones to load, to develop. We want them to load symmetrically and balanced. Um, and I know there's a lot of discussion about, you know, when we should and shouldn't ride them and when we should and shouldn't break them in, um, which again is like a, a can of worms. A huge can of worms. <laughs> But, you know, from a physiological perspective, we want to load the bones. So the bones have the most change between two and three years old. And so we do want to be loading the bones in that time. Um, and so that doesn't mean not to be riding them in that time, but it means that we probably shouldn't be riding them for more than 10 minutes at a time. Right. You know, and, and really look at how we're, how we're loading them. So obviously going out and doing a... Um, two-year-old, I don't know, I'm not, is it, do they have two-year-old futurities? Like those type uh, of events? No, futurities are three, but they start them at yeah, two. Is, to their... Yeah, so they're starting at two, those quarter horses like doing rollbacks and, and those sorts of loading, like that's very stressful and those horses don't stay sound for a long life. Right. You know, as opposed to going out for a hack. <laughs> right. You know, for for um you know you ride them for 10 minutes and then you hop off and you walk them <laughs> like the more they can move the more they can get out and move like that's optimal the more we can get them into a good um balanced state within their body that's optimal so it's not a it's not a question of just leaving them it's like mindfully loading them and how what's the frequency on that loading that would be in other words i know that you know you you have to have the recovery phase in order for the bones and the ligaments and muscles to, to build. So what's, what would be the interval between that 10 minute loading? Um, well, a, a bone obviously doesn't change that quickly. So what we're doing by getting off them is just giving their fascia and their muscles a rest so that the bones not being um, uns like low, not that they're not fatiguing. So then the bones being loaded in an abnormal position. Bone takes at least kind of 72 hours to remodel. Okay. So, um, and obviously it's it's in a constant remodeling process and you don't, with bone, to continue that remodeling process, you don't want to like load it one day and then not load it for two weeks. You'll, you lose the benefit of the remodeling, if that makes sense. Like you, you want to have um, some degree of continued stress to create remodeling but when we it depends what we're talking about like when we're talking about bone you know a couple of times a week higher intensity for five to ten minutes is enough you know so like a hard like trotting on a hard surface for five to ten minutes is enough to stimulate remodeling in bone um if you're talking about like the fascial response and the muscular response then you just want to get off them for enough time for all of that to rehydrate and reset. So, um, you know, that, and, and that's going to depend what you've been doing, but it might just be 10, five or 10 minutes. It might, you know, within a couple of minutes, they might be okay. So it, every individual horse is going to be a little bit different depending on how much groundwork and stuff you did before and what state their body's strength wise is in. Right. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but I know that I was just thinking, like in terms of uh, with a two or a three year old. Yeah. What? How many days a week would you want to do that ten minute intensity? Okay, so then, um, well, you only need to do exercise two or three times a week to create a change. Okay. So if you're doing it less than that, like you're just probably not gaining as much from it but then it depends what you're doing um and like if you're doing postural work I think once a week you can gain from that um but if you're looking at kind of your loading then I would two to three times a week but yeah just 10 minute sessions and then building up to 10 minutes but hopping off and then doing another 10 minutes rather than continuing it to 20 minutes got it okay so yeah, well, that's to get into a whole other uh, discussion on that. Yeah, now. and I mean, I'm you know, I think we're all still figuring that out, but I don't think the idea of not riding them until they're five or six is necessarily correct. 
Um, but I do think we need to be setting them up much better for riding and be very, very mindful about how we ride them earlier than that and not staying on them for long periods of time, not competing them for long periods of time, um, you know, keeping those intervals very short. And I mean, mentally, and like that's a whole other aspect as well. But um, yeah, I think we have to be conditioning them better to be ridden rather than just breaking in and then now we're riding them. Right. And that was the kind of, you know, the one of the, there's like the extremes is not touch them. And then the other is sit on them for an hour when you're just breaking them in and, yeah. you know, um, and working in deep footing and all that sort of yes. thing, overstressing everything. So that's like Goldilocks. This is too much. This is too little. And you got to figure out what's just right. Yeah. And you've got to figure out what you've got available to you as right. well, um, you know, to, to make it just right. But yeah, I think the footing is super important. The type of saddle we put on them first, how we hop on them first, um, all the preparation work that we've done. There should be, you know, absolute minimum of three months of groundwork done before we even consider hopping on them. You know, they should have a strong back before we sit on them, um, whether it's for 10 minutes or not. They should be as symmetrical as possible. Their feet should be as balanced as possible. You know, um, yeah, I think it's, it's never as simple as here's your recipe. Right, right. And and this is what you do because every situation is going to be um, different and we have to tailor that to the individual horse with our minds on physiology. And and we have to start thinking about the long term, not the so many people, it's like the 30 day break and that's 30 days of the first year. Of the If you want that horse to last at least 24 or 20, you know, 30, You've got to consider that in your start. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a big mistake, like doing, doing, um, like sending horses away to be broken in for three, six weeks. Um, it's a mistake. Like it, it takes as long as it takes and the longer it takes, probably the better for your horse if you can tailor it to your horse individually. Um, and then it shouldn't be an issue and the, there shouldn't, be any bucking or rearing or any responses like that because if you know that your horse is in a completely balanced state then there's no need for them to respond in that way like you know if they don't have any pain and the saddle is fitting and they've been properly prepared like the bre breaking in process should just be an easy process yeah I think um, that doesn't boring. require that six week intense sorry I think of it it should be boring to the people, yeah. watching, it should be so boring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean, I'll tell you in another year or two <laughs> how yeah. I go with that. But um, yeah, my biggest thing is that if her body is not in a in the right place, if I'm not happy with all of her gates, um, then I shouldn't even be considering getting on her. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just going to go back to ulcers. So ulcers, I think, is something that's probably not really thought about in foals as much. Like, I think it's uh, getting a lot more attention in performance horses these days and a lot more recognition as a cause of girthiness. But I don't think that it's considered enough of a problem in foals. Um, I've treated a couple of foals. There was one little foal, and it was the cutest little, like, thing. And um, I think it was only... It was quite young, like maybe it was only still in its first week of life when I, it might have even been three days old. It was quite young. So usually we let them settle a bit longer, but I was there treating other horses on that day. So, you know, let's have a look at the foal. That foal, if it had teeth, it would have like taken a chunk out of me. It was so angry, so angry for a little foal that was three days old. And I, I remember thinking, what, like, why? Um, why does this foal want to kill me? And, I mean, it was so little I could just hold it and it couldn't do anything and it had no teeth, so it wasn't a problem. But it was so grumpy. And every time I went down to his sternum, he was just like, I wish I could kill you right now. So what I knew, though, about that foal is that the mare had 
quite severe laminitis and had had um, butte throughout the period. Um, and she was a, a, an older man. I think that might've even been the last fall that she had. Um, so yeah, in, in hindsight, like that fall had ulcers, I'm sure of it. And it was another fall, you know, so the, the man would be very stressed, high cortisol levels, as well as some butte. Um, and I don't think that we consider the effects of the stress enough on the foal and those, how those high cortisol levels can influence their development and especially their gut. Um, and then another one was, again, the same thing. A mare with really severe laminitis had had to have a lot of non to keep her comfortable, um, you know, to the point of foaling. And that was a little foal that I think the first time wouldn't let me touch him. The second time I think I managed to treat him because he was asleep mm. um, on the ground. So I managed to get in there and just do a little bit while he was sleeping. Um, and, and then the third time, every time he touched his bum, it was one of those little poppy folds that, you know, every time he touched him, he'd be popping around and kind of want to kick you and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, as I would say that um, he had ulcers as well. And they were both very young, like within first couple of weeks so there have been some studies done where they show that 22 percent um, of foals of all ages it was quite a big study had um, signs of gastric ulcers but what they also noted was that they weren't looking at the subtler signs of ulcers so they were just picking up um, more gross pathology and so they said in gastro in gastroscopic studies that it can be up to 55 percent of foals because they're picking up the more subtler um, changes in the mucosa so that's pretty high like yeah. when you think one in two foals um, has ulcers and that there was a higher incidence of ulcers definitely when they've had any um, other gastrointestinal disease or any other underlying disease like even arth you know septic arthritis or I guess any disease is going to cause stress mm -hmm. um, it was also higher in weaning. So weaning is a super high stress time and we really should be just treating them for ulcers um, preventatively in that time. Um, and then obviously if they've had any periods of non steroidal use such as butte, um, then that's going to increase their chance of ulcers as well. So from a body work or, and behavioural perspective, like these foals can be quite reactive. They might be very grumpy foals. Um, you know, more aggressive. Um, like, there's no reason a foal should be aggressive. Like, right. you know, so if they're showing kind of signs of being aggressive, then they're probably in pain. Um, and, uh, you know, from a body perspective, these can cause um, restrictions within their withers and their lumbar and um, the girthiness uh, and and just pain and just said it's just setting up a pain um, process in a in a young foal which could then influence their interactions with humans and create other negative associations what what would it do they typically treat foal foals that have ulcers what do they typically use to treat them so um i'm not sure exactly what they're treating them with now whether they're using a meprazole um i think they use to use a lot of ranitidine um and sulcrophate, so which is more designed to does better on the hindgut ulcers, but I'm pretty sure a meprazole, it might not be used in little little foals, um, but I think it's used in older foals. But otherwise, as they kind of creep feed, so in in weaning, you could use you know products like your um, digestive EQ or um, Colado digestive gastroid recovery you know you could use those sorts of preventative products um but um yeah i just have to check the licensing of a meprazole for little little foals right but it does bring up the question of weaning and the best you know the low stress methods versus the high stress stress methods absolutely like the lower stress we can make weaning um the the better so again a gradual process is often less stressful, having friends, all of those sorts of 
influencing factors. And this might be off topic, but what what would be, I know that it's, the, this is an average, but what's the average age of a foal for weaning? Well, I think it's probably anywhere between six to nine months. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, we, we, you see cats and dogs that have been weaned early and there are weird behaviors because of it. And I'm sure that with horses that are weaned early, you're going to see strange behaviors because that, you know, they're designed to be with their moms. <laughs> That's yep. it's supposed to be. And I think the important aspect, and I think this is why we see it in dogs and cats. Like I've known a few really horrible cats that were orphan kittens and they've turned into very aggressive little things. Um, and I think they, the important thing is that even if you wean them earlier, that they're with other horses, you know, so that they're still getting those social interactions with other horses. So they're still learning, you know, what's okay and what's not okay. Right. Um, because, yeah, any animal by themselves at a young age, um, like they're often the ones that become really difficult. Like when you go and you buy a young horse at six months of age and you take it home to your property and it's your one and only horse, right? you know, I think those horses can become very difficult. And I mean, I've just noticed I have like my two thoroughbreds, Henry and Mooney, and they are absolutely pivotal in teaching Ali Mae. Like they do my job for me. Like they, they are more, more consistent than I am. They're more persistent than I am. And they're like, these are the, these are the rules. Like I've told you, and I'll tell you again, these are the rules. These are the rules. Like, so if they didn't have that, like she's getting that every day, every feed time, you know, all interactions in the paddock, she's getting feedback from them. And so if she didn't have that at 18 months of age and she's only having human interactions where most of the time it's a positive react interaction, like they're just missing out on learning so many um, important um, uh, well, yeah, yeah, important interactions that set them up for life. Yeah. Social interactions, which yeah. I know that this is going to be a little off topic as well, but you know, the whole idea of, but I want to ask you this from a neurological perspective. Okay. Not so much a training or behavior, but from a neurological perspective, the idea of imprinting where the person goes in and handles the foal the minute it's born. Um, how do you feel about that? And what, what are the things to watch out for there? Um, I think the things to watch out for are just doing too much of that. Like, I don't think it's a bad thing for them to, um, you know, recognize human beings as part of their life because we are um, and to be able to be handled and all of that. But I think, you know, it's how much we do of that and for how long we do it for and for what we also do in that time. So, for example, lots of people will do bum scratches, you know, because it's cute. The foal backs up to you and then you do bum scratches. Well, that can become a huge safety issue later in life, you know. So, um, you know, even Ali Mae, she got her, her um, old owner sucked into that and it was so interesting. He came and visited, what is it, like, three months later and she remembered that he was the bum scratching person oh. <laughs> you know so like she backed up to him over the fence for him to scratch her bum um and I had to tell her that that's not okay because um you know it's just dangerous for them to do that sort of interaction so we have to be mindful about what we do in that time because they can so easily be imprinted um yeah. and you know so not letting them like be all over you and not letting them back up to you for bum scratches. And I know it's all so cute, but it's not setting them up for success. Right. And you know, I, before I ever heard of imprinting, I inadvertently imprinted a foal. It was born and I handled it and I, it was gentle handling. It wasn't any of the kind of rough invasive stuff that I've seen other people talk about, but that foal was, and then there was a lot of people around it had other horses, but that was a nightmare fall in the end. Yeah. Um, I think if we overdo it, then um, it makes them, it makes it 
yeah, hard for them to recognise interactions. Like, the, you know, the good thing with Ali May, she was born into a herd of horses um, and she had some human contact, like she had her feet done, she had, we got treat, she got treated, she got all of those things and then she had just times where they were just, you know, hanging out and stuff, but it wasn't every day. Yeah. It was sporadic. So it wasn't an expected, like, yeah, she's super friendly and she is always sniffing your face and stuff, but she's not doing dangerous behaviours like trying to walk on me or or um, anything like that because, I, like, I'm just not in her, she didn't have people in her environment that much. Yeah. And but I have seen the same thing when they've had a lot of people in their environment that it, it can be, create a lot of um, discourse. Well, and, and it's, in my opinion, it's not setting them up for success because they don't recognize good, they don't have good boundaries. And yes. later when we have to establish boundaries, it's, you have to be yes. so much louder. And yeah, whereas, you know, a horse that's been- And raised, then they think, oh, that's so rude now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just, it's, I think what you're saying is we really need to consider the adult horse that we are bringing up not yes. the baby that's cute yes and that's hard that's hard it's because really hard yeah it, they are cute um but yep. you know having their front legs over your shoulders is not a good idea <laughs> nope okay good. no absolutely not and yeah i think we have to think if this was a big horse would we tolerate it or would we be safe? I think that's the... Oh, would, oh would, yeah, and that's what it really comes down to is right. the safety aspect. Right. Huge, yeah, very important. Yeah. Okay, so where am I at? All right, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about assessing posture and confirmation. Um, this is Ali May. Just last week, I think, um, and what I wanted to show you here is how we can observe them just in, in their own um, environment and what we can take away from those observations. So if you just have a look at these three pictures here, I want you just to think like, what do you observe in these pictures? Like in the way that she's standing um, and in her general kind of posture eating and you can you know stick stick some things in the chat if you want and just say um what differences you notice in between these pictures um and anything else about her stance okay you guys you gotta put something in the chat one one thing you notice at least <laughs> we have a quiet audience yeah, I won't. I won't make them wait too long because we don't want too much time on the recording. All right. No, nobody seems brave enough to put something. In. <laughs> okay. So I'll just point it out. Okay. Um. So in the left photo here, yeah, she's got one one leg forward eating. Um. Thanks, Emma. So in the left photo here, she's got her right front foot forward, and it's not too forward. You know, it's forward. In the middle picture, she's got them square. And then in the left picture, she's got her left front foot forward and it's a bit further forward. So, you know, um, in this moment, you would say she looks to be left forward uh, more dominant, which is common. They'll usually have more weight on that right foot. Um, the other thing that you can notice is her left hind is turned out slightly. Um, and she's a little kind of close behind. And this is not a great angle, but you could say there's a bit, looks a bit angled on her pelvis there as well. So, um, but what I always, yeah, slightly kind of cow hopped. Um, what I'm always looking for is do they graze with either front foot forward and do they suckle on both sides of the mare? And I'll often have people say to me, yeah, yeah, they suckle on both sides of the mare. Okay, but do they suckle in the same posture on both sides of the mare? Like, does it look comfortable on both sides of the mare? So they might suckle on both sides, but how do they stand when they suckle on both sides? And what's their, you know, are they twisting their head more on one side or do they have a leg in a different position always on one side? Or, um, 
you know, where's their body positioned? Is it the same on both sides or is it one side, do they suckle a bit in a different position? Uh, and that's really important because sometimes they won't suckle on both sides because of the mare and it could be that the mare has a problem and so they, it's not comfortable for the mare to be sucked on both sides. Or sometimes it could be the foal, you know, it might come down to their fractured ribs or um, some other pain uh, or restriction in their body that it's more comfortable for them to suckle on one side. So that's really important when we're looking at foals. And then as they start grazing, we want to see, well, how do they graze? And um, I didn't put the photo in, but, you know, there's a lot of foals that graze like really spread, really spread out. Um, and people say, oh, it's just because their neck's not long enough and blah, blah, blah. But their neck could be not long enough because they have pain in there. And so everything is a bit stuck like this. So they have to do this to be able to get their head down because their neck is not able to extend out of their chest. So when I see a foal like grazing like that, I just want to treat it because you want to, if you can get them grazing in a more balanced position from the start and you can free up that neck um, and that thoracic junction, um, then and if they've got wither pain, for example, and wither restriction, so in that thoracic area, then again, they're not going to have that freedom to lengthen the neck and to move those scapulars. And when we were in, um, in Netherlands and we were watching the Coney courses grazing, the foals had no predilection to um, either leg and most of them graze square and it looked so easy for them to graze square. Like it was not, it was like, like they weren't grazing square and their legs were out here. They were grazing square and it looked like easy peasy. And that's the way it should look. But I think in the domestic world, we've lost that so much for different reasons, which could come back to all the stuff we've talked about. Right. Um, and we need to be aiming aiming back for that. So for Ali May, her um, posture has been a problem. And I knew this from the day I assessed her because um, as a foal, uh, she was very well put together and she had a real nice little chunky body and I, uh, I've got a picture of her coming up. But then when I got her, she's had a few injuries and her sternum was stuck forward and she often have a wide base stance in front. Um, and the way she moved through her shoulder and her elbow was almost like an elbow horse, um, like a horse with elbow arthritis. She had a real dissociation with her, um, mostly her front left leg. Um, and so that's taken me a bit to, to treat because now she's a bit older um, and their attention span is a little less. <laughs> so you've got to work within that as well. But one thing that I've been doing, which um, obviously then I'm not interfering with her, is the way I feed her. So I think, and Sharon talked about variable feeding positions. Have you had her? Um, I've that? tried to get her for that and so far I've been unsuccessful. Um, yeah, okay. Well, I'll talk a little bit about it. So um, the first thing I did was put her into different feeding positions. Now she only has a hard feeds only like five minutes. Like she's hardly getting fed a hard feed at all. Um, but you can see here that now she's standing square in front and this was not the case when I got her. Um, she'd often, even with her feet up high, still split her legs a bit. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just in a kind of neutral position. The other thing when I got her was her neck was much more dropped down. So her neck is starting to come up without me doing much at all. Um, and then I feed her from a hay bag. I don't feed her from a hay net because I don't want to, you know, young horses are less patient. And so I don't want to create that like pulling and bracing. So I'm feeding her from a hay bag and sometimes she takes from the top, sometimes she takes from the bag. Um, but you can see here that she is standing square. So that's the way that you can do this from a young age uh, without you having to interfere because obviously their attention span is small. And so you, you know, want to do as many things where you're not interfering, if you can. The other thing is 
with young horses is pullback injuries. Um, and I mean, this is a pretty horrific one on the on the left, but uh, and then um, what's going to say? One pullback injury can destroy a horse. Uh, yeah. And I've seen numerous horses over my time of treating where I've had one pullback injury, and I'm like, wow, that's amazing how much damage it created in the whole body, like the pole, the base of the neck the sacroiliac, the pelvis, the lumbosacral joint, sometimes the hamstrings. Um, and, and often once they pull back and they have pain, they'll continue to pull back. And I, I do believe that horses that continue to pull back, a lot of it is pain related rather than necessarily a learnt behaviour. Um, I mean, Henry used to know that if he just flicked his head, he could break the hay string. That was a learnt behaviour. Um, but a horse that goes into that, like feels that pressure and then just keeps pulling, to me they're doing that because it's so uncomfortable and they just don't know how else to relieve the discomfort. Um, so I will not tie up a young horse until I am 110% certain that they know pressure and release. Um, and obviously there's a lot of training methods to do that, but you'll see here, I've got Ali Mae. This is the first time I'd tied her up um, and she's just wrapped around the post. So if she pulls back, it will relieve, but it's not, not I can then grab the end and it's not gonna, she's not gonna get away. So it's a long enough rope that she's not gonna get away. So she's not gonna learn that if I do this, I get away, but it just means that when she does it, she's not pulling into, pressure um, and I mean obviously because she was rearing and stuff it wasn't pressure was an issue for her um, and so the last thing I want her to do is her to flip over because one flip over and you also can fracture the wither you can fracture the pelvis you can fracture the skull um, you can damage the scapular cartilage like again I've seen a lot of older horses that have, flip, have obviously had flip over injuries in their time um, and once they're kind of older, it's just much harder to, um, to fix it. Uh, so what I know with, um, no, yeah, I'll just keep talking about pullback injuries. So um, I've often come to the foals and whenever I go and say hi to a foal, I always feel their pole. And um, I remember going to a client's place one day and I said, oh, what happened to him? Like, his pole doesn't feel good today. Oh, yeah, he did do a little pullback. And like, so, you know, if I feel that I'm treating it straight away because it makes them reactive, it makes them difficult to handle, and then everything is just a flow and effect from there. And before you know it, you've got a huge problem. Um, and they're very reactive. I had another horse. He was, he'd been to the vets and he had an eye injury. And I treated him before, you know, as a foal. And he had a pretty good body, no major issues. Um, just a little bit of wither stuff. And mm, I don't even think he had much pelvic stuff. Um, but after he came back from the vets, he was throwing his head up and he'd given the owner a black eye. And, um, you know, when I felt around his pole, it was just in spasm. So we treated that and his behaviour went back to what it was before. So... Yeah, if your horse does have to happen to have a pullback, then I'd recommend, you know, a week later getting someone to check them. Don't do it straight away because they might be too sore, but just um, a week later have a bodywork treatment and check for any issues from that pullback incident. Um, the other huge, huge thing is hoof balance management, which we touched on with what are the, what are the foals um, standing on when they're first born and what are they moving on? Um, but this is vital and I, I think um, more attention needs to be play, uh, more attention needs to be paid to hoof balance in the growing horse because we talked about the growth plates um, and the way that these hooves are loading is going to influence how those growth plates close. So um, they should be trimmed on a regular basis like five absolute maximum six weeks just like a normal horse from sometimes from day one um, depending if they've got an issue 
So oh, I think I forgot to put this picture. No, I think I've got it at the end. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, it's a horse that, that we, you know, this was really important in. And when I say trimmed, I mean, early on, it's like a little rasp here and a little rasp there. It's just to keep it balanced. It's, it's not a full trim. It's just to keep it growing in a balanced way. And you can tell a lot from your horse's hooves. So if as the horse is growing, the hooves change, that means that you've got a change in the, um, you know, in the body potentially. So if they start wearing a certain part of the hoof um, or the hoof starts growing in a, in a different way, then something might, might have happened. They might have had a fall or, um, you know, I think it gives you a good window into the horse's body. Um, here is Ellie May's front feet on the day she arrived. So she has been regularly trimmed, um, you know, by a, by a good trimmer. She does have long pastons um, in front. And so that is always going to be a management thing to, to keep that hoof balance short. But in behind, her feet were really um, imbalanced. So the medial lateral imbalance was out. The toe was really long. Um, and so it's interesting because you could say, oh, like it's a trimmer issue and the trimmer has left the toes too long. But when I started looking at her body and realizing that her pelvis was asymmetrical and that, um, you know, she was always resting a hind limb and she was showing evidence of discomfort in her hind end. And as that's improving and now her hoof balance is improving as well, um, then it, it, it goes hand in hand. Like you've got to correct the hoof, but at the same time, you've got to correct the way the hoof's being loaded by the body. Um, so super, super important. I can't stress the importance of regular hoof maintenance early on in a foal's life. The other thing is paddock accidents. I just want to say that one thing about that, because it's so fascinating that people get their babies and they toss them out and they think they're going to be fine and they're going to wear their feet and they don't put the no. investment into the hoof balance as babies. Yeah. But that's setting them up for asymmetry, essentially, then. Yeah. It's setting up for asymmetry and even just having long toes. So even just, just going for too long without a trim. Um, I've got pictures of horses that um, just haven't been trimmed. You'll get that U-neck look. Um, and you, you get, you know, dropping through the back and altered pelvic angles and things just from going too long between trims. Yeah. So that's without even any other kind of medial lateral kind of imbalances. So I think you're doing your foal a disservice to just throw them out in the paddock for six months to grow without trimming them. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Okay. Um, paddock accidents. So people say to me, yeah, but my horse has done nothing. Like it's two and or three or four, like it's never been ridden. <laughs> like, so it shouldn't have any problems because it hasn't done anything. But horses do stuff in the paddocks all the time and they fall over when we don't see, they slip in the mud, they have fights with other horses, you know, they get kicked, they get bitten, they get chased, they like... All sorts of things happen to young horses, whether they're in a herd or not in a herd. Like, they just do stupid stuff. So like, so this list here, ran into a wire fence, fell in a trough, injured her stifle, slipped in the mud. That's just Allie Mae. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just her list that I know of. Right. Um, actually, she's also, she injured her eye um as well so i've missed a few injuries on this list she's 18 months old okay so um th these are all of her issues so when i got her i knew all of these injuries whereas most of the time you buy a young horse and you don't know these injuries um so i could then understand why her neck felt weird you know, and she had a lot of tension around C2, C3. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that was probably the time when she ran into the wire and her head, you know, went into a hyperflexion. So I was like, okay, I understand that. When I realised her pelvis was like this, I'm like, okay, I understand why that happened. Um, 
So, you know, I understand why her body is the way it is, but for a lot of people, you wouldn't even think about think about that they could have had accidents before you bought them as a 12 month old. And, and on the flip side of that, you can't just stick them in a box and expect them to grow up and be okay. They need to move. So just like yes. Justin, this, I mean, you try to ch- protect them as much as you can, but yes. it's part of life. But you still have to close your eyes when they run yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. And other horses can be brutal. Um, yes. And I'm constantly like, oh, Mooney, don't be so mean. Like, no, not there. There's the mud, there's the fence. And then I'm like, oh. <laughs> And, you know, yesterday she was cantering around because she was obviously a bit cold. And I'm like, not there. There's mud there. Like, you'll slip. Um, but it's just, you know, what, what they're going to do. And that's why we just need to treat them and recognise when their body. So, like, I know right now I haven't treated Ali May for a few weeks and she might have slipped again in the mud because it's been so slippery. But, like, I noticed her you know, the way she's holding her left hind at the moment and her, her neck is not where it was a few weeks ago where I was really happy with her body. And she's growing. Um, and and she's growing. And they don't grow symmetrically at all. <laughs> exactly. And actually, that's another point that I want to make. So horses grow and they grow asymmetrically and they'll sometimes be bum high and wither high and stuff and, and all of that. What I've noticed in treating young horses and the comments that have been made from my clients who bred a lot of horses is that when we treat them, they grow much more symmetrically and they grow like looking like a horse. So um, one comment that I had from an owner was that um, that he, you know, he'd had a lot of young horses and he said they always go through that gangly, horrible stage and then they kind of stay in it and, you know, it takes them a long time to look like a horse. The colt that we treated, he has just grown looking like a horse the whole time. So since we started treating him, so before I treated him, he was 18 months old and he hadn't had any treatments before that and he was looking pretty gangly. But then... By the time we'd finished with his rehab, he looked like a horse and he wasn't doing a whole lot of rehab to make him look like that. It was the treatments that helped him to balance his growth periods. So a few weeks ago, Ali Mae did have a growth spurt where her bum became higher and I treated her and it just evened her out. And, you know, what I can say now is even her her old owner came a couple of weeks ago and said oh wow she's looking like a horse instead of like a baby and she has all the other young horses at home that still look like young horses so um, I think that's another benefit of treating them is to actually get them to grow in a more balanced way that's really interesting because bones grow and then muscles get tight and this is, you know, we can get problems like lock upward fixation of the patella and things with growth because the bones grow too quick and then the muscles and the fascia have to respond. But if we can relieve some of that tension, then we can help support that growth. Wow. That's, I mean, it makes sense. It's just that we, how do I put this? We've become so conditioned to the awkward looking stages. Yes. Yeah, and I just don't think that they need to, um, yeah, I think you can help them through those awkward stages. Yeah. Yeah, and Emma's just saying, yeah, yeah, found sessions on young horses assist in their body growth and balance. And I think the balance is is the real key there, that if we can help them grow in a balanced way, then we're reducing those stresses on the body. Sure. I mean, it makes sense. And they treat... And like osteos and stuff treat a lot of kids. Yeah. You know, so they treat babies and um, kids all through their growth period to help them, you know, stop problems, basically. Okay. And then, I mean, I've talked about all of this already, but really what it comes down to is that mental balance. And if we can have symmetry, we can have a healthy spinal um, cord and we can have healthy neurological uh pathways and and we can have healthy neurological processes setting up in the body 
Uh, we can have good motor control. Um, what I also noticed with Ali May is her proprioception is really was really poor. Um, and okay, young horses, young children, they have poor proprioception. But if I can start making her aware of that now, then that's only going to help her with her limb awareness um, as we grow. And we haven't got to sure foot pads yet, but <laughs> they're, they're on the list, um, you know, because uh, what I've also noticed is with treatment, that proprioception has changed and she's not hitting the poles hardly at all now. She's actually thinking, I have to pick up my legs. Where are they? Whereas at the start, it was like, she didn't care what she walked over. She's not, doesn't have any fear like that. So therefore she just walk over it and her legs would just like hit everything. So if I could make her aware of that now, and this is where I think we need to be working with young horses from this perspective, different terrains, different little exercises, keeping them busy, but thinking about their proprioception. I think that's one of the most important things along with movement we can do in a young horse. Um, before we kind of start the conditioning of them. Um, yeah, and Emma said birth trauma in humans is massive. So yeah. uh, I think it's the same problem in horses. So when are the pivotal times to treat? I'm sure this is the question on everyone's mind. Like, when should I be treating my foal? Um, so usually within one month of age, um, sometimes in the first couple of weeks at everything could be a bit too sore for them to treat. And I mean, I usually I treat them when I'm there. So it just, it's just however it falls generally for me. But my, my rule is I generally want to see them a minimum of two times as a foal. Um, and if they have any issues, that's when I'll see them more. So I'll treat them two times and I'll make sure that I'm happy with the way everything's balanced, that they've opened through their chest, that their scapulas are sitting well, their pelvis is balanced and they're moving well around the paddock. Um, and then I'm happy to, to let them go until I, the owner notices any problems and then we would treat them as required. Um, the other time would be post weaning. So once they've gone through the, the you know, weaning stage, then checking have they done anything in that weaning phase they might have injured themselves got kicked by another horse um, you know learning how to get away from new horses things like that so you want to just check them post weaning which might be a few weeks post like once they've settled everything's settled the other important time is uh post gelding so uh different state you know different horses are gelded at different times anywhere from what five months to years um, and, you know, there have been the papers to show that they can get uh, problems with gelding scars and neuromas, and, um, you know, that's quite a hot topic these days as well, and the effect of gelding scars on movement. Um, so I had a, so the same cult actually that had the nerve trauma that I was talking about before, he um, went away to be broken in, and when he came back, I'm like, gosh, his lumbar area just feels so weird and it doesn't really seem to be from the saddle and I was like oh, I just don't really know what's going on and I I forgot that he'd been gelded mm. so and then all of a sudden I was talking to the owner and he said oh yeah blah blah, blah is gelding now so I'm like oh my god that's what's going on so then I checked and sure enough like there was one part of the um you know the the gelding scar area that was a problem and as soon as I rectified that his lumbar released wow. so um I'd been working on his lumbar for probably half an hour trying to think like why is this not like what is going on here but the problem was underneath so recognizing though and, and you, if you can treat them sooner rather than treating them as five six year seven year olds like I'm treating some where they're much older um then obviously it's going to be a better outcome for growth because if they've got a restriction in there, that's going to change the way that that pelvic and lumbar area grow as well. So treating them post-gelding, you want to give them time to obviously settle down. So it might be, uh, you know, six or eight weeks after gelding. I'm not really sure of the optimal time there, um, but definitely not in that first two weeks. Absolute um, that would be the absolute minimum time. I think I was treating him about, 
eight weeks later because um, he'd been away from breaking them. Um, after starting and before starting, so if you are sending them away for a break, like we talked about the, you know, ideally we shouldn't need to do that these days and we should make it a longer process and um, all of that. But if you are, then getting them checked before they go and making sure that there's no reason for them to buck, rear or bolt. Um, and you might want to do a couple of sessions before they go. And then when they come back, you definitely want to check because, um, you know, they might have pulled back or they might have twisted or who, who knows, but you definitely want to check them a couple of times after that period. And then just during any periods of growth, which we talked about before. So if you're noticing they're looking really gangly and asymmetrical, then uh, getting a treatment in that time and then any known trauma or imbalances. So, yeah, if you've seen them fall over, even if they seem fine, um, they can seem fine and have quite serious pelvic injuries. So even if they seem fine, if you've seen them have a, a twist and a slip in the paddock, you're better off just to get them treated. Just, just sort it out then and there so it doesn't set up any compensatory patterns. And then in terms of recommended types of treatments, um, I probably tend to treat them more osteopathically and craniosacrally because um, oh, that's just the way I treat um, and I just follow the body that way. I do often do a little uh, one or two chiropractic adjustments. It depends on the fall um, and how sore they are. And sometimes I won't chiropractically adjust them first, but that's not my, like I'm trained in chiropractic, but um, you know, I wouldn't say that that's my highest skill, if that makes sense. Like some chiropractors, they're so quick and good at adjusting that they get such a quick, immediate response like Ian Bidstra um, because of, of their um, accuracy and stuff. So whereas I, my skills are better in the osteopathic kind of way. Uh, physiotherapy, so I've seen like some physios treat, you know, there was a physio that I know treated a horse with really bad scol fall with really bad scoliosis um, and got that fall straight. Um, muscle release therapy, so I often use that as well, um, depending how much I can touch the fall. So if I can't touch the fall that much, I prefer for it to be a positive experience and I will just do some EMRT on them. So that's, I can do a few moves and then just let them be um, rather than force the treatment on them. And then they're not in a relaxed state. So I usually will treat them in a stall. Um, most of the time I'm just holding them and working with them and the owner's just keeping me safe and holding them there. Um, I don't want them to be stressed. So I just do what I can on the foal rather than have anyone help me. Um, and then taping. So I've got a little couple of examples here of taping. Um, this horse was a, uh, this uh, person was someone who trained with me in taping um, and she's a very good therapist in the Netherlands. And the only thing she used on this horse was taping. She didn't treat this horse in any other way. And so he has a bit of uh, angular limb deformities and this was in, within um, three days of tape application and this horse was two months old um, and so within three days of taping we had this response wow um, and that's all she did I asked her did you do anything other treatment and you can see this horse still has some imbalances like it's standing square but the shoulders are not balance and the scapulas are not balanced. So there's potentially also some other stuff going on under there, but perhaps some of that will normalize once, you know, it's been straighter for a bit longer. Um, so that is pretty cool. Uh, this little foal, uh, it's, these are not good pictures and I didn't have very good pictures of it, but uh, this foal had the, it, it laid down for too long after it was born and the owners were like, there's something not right with the foal. It's not moving much. Um, and when it does move, it's really unstable in its hind end. And the stifle was really unstable. And this foal was probably, it was at the point that I was like, oh, maybe, maybe we need to refer it. Like there's something seriously wrong. 
Um, anyway, I treated this foal more than I would usually treat a foal. I think I treated it three or four times. And it still wasn't, it was probably 90% moving, cantering, trotting. Um, definitely within the first treatment, it became more active um, and then gradually improved from there. And um, I haven't seen it for a while, but last time I saw it, it looked pretty normal. So, uh, but that was probably one of the most severe issues I've had um, after, straight after birth. And we treated that horse within a week of being born um, mm -hmm. because of how bad, how bad she was. And you can see even here, so this was just in the first treatment, I think, and you can see the, the stance behind. And even in the one treatment, you can still see there's quite an imbalance in the pelvis, but she started standing a lot better with her hind legs in a more balanced um, position. But yeah, she, she had a fair few issues. And this little guy, um, this little guy, if he could have, if he could have, uh, actually he did bite me on the face one day, like he, this little guy was angry. He had plenty of reasons to be angry. He'd been dealing with pain, I think a lot. He'd been stood on by numerous horses because he was just laying down all the time. He didn't want to get up. Um, he, it was so painful for him to move. And so he had a lot of reasons to be grumpy. And, and we did treat him for ulcers and we did use a meprazole. And I was working with him with another vet um, and then also with a farrier as well. So he was very complicated um, in terms of, I'll show you his video. So here you can see how awkwardly he was sucking and how his stance was. This is how he stood. Um, with his, you can see also the tension in his tendons here. Um, and here you can see, I think this was before the second treatment, you can already see that he has his front legs more under his body um, and that um, they're not, yeah, that everything's starting to stand. He doesn't have this pain line as much either. So um, I used tape and I did a lot of other treatment on his body as well. Um, you can see this was his permanent expression yeah. on his face. Um, and so you can already see though in this picture that his legs have become a much more normal position and they're nowhere near as upright as they are here even. Yeah. So you can see how upright they are there and how the hoof pattern axis is improving, but he's still offloading this left um, front. And then here, you can see that he's standing like his bum has developed. This is what I'm talking about. His body looks like a horse now, not like a foal. He has much more balanced development throughout his whole body. Um, his neck set is improved. His shoulders improved. Um, the movement that he had through his spine and his pelvis, because his pelvis was being restricted from his front legs, always offloading them. Um, so his whole body balance improved and his demeanor did did improve. He'll always have attitude, I think. What um, breed is he? He's a standard bred. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is his video before I treated him. So you can see how much weight he's putting on his hind legs and how he's very upright. If anyone's followed my Facebook page, they would have already seen this. Um, he's very straight legged, very upright, and he is bit lame in that left leg so he had contracted tendons um, but what really shows up is how much weight he's carrying on his hind end because he just can't move his front legs normally and then in this photo this is at the end of my treatments I think So you can see his hoof pass and axis is normal. He's still a little bit lame, but his back legs are able square. to start straightening up. Hey? He's so square on the top line. Yeah, and, he, and you can also see the balance through his whole body. Like he looks yeah. balanced now through his whole body. 
So he had a really hard time, though, the poor guy. At one point, we thought that he was penetrating um, his pedal bone through his hoof. Um, he ended up, I think it was after three treatments, he ended up abscessing really bad, which is what can happen. Like, you you know, activating all the circulation, you can get a, a release of toxins. And he abscessed really bad. And um, at that point, we got him x-ray to just check we were really concerned that he'd have rotation, but he didn't. Um, so he didn't have any rotation. And then he went on to, yeah, be worked more with the farrier. And that foot was an ongoing problem. But as far as I'm aware, like he's still, um, he's still alive. <laughs> and at, when the point I started treating him, the next option was to put him down. So he's still going. I'm pretty sure the foot is good now, but I know they had ongoing issues with it. It took a while to clear the abscess, abscessing up um, in his front feet. So, yeah, the poor little guy, he really had a really hard time. Um, but I think we've given him a life that he wouldn't have had. Yeah. And then this is Ali Mae. <laughs> so um, what you can see here is she wouldn't stand square behind. She always wanted to stand with her left front for left hand forward. And there was quite an imbalance in her pelvis with her left side being higher and more contracted. Um, and so I suspect maybe when she fell in the trough or maybe another time, like she's fallen and fallen on that left side and, you know, it's compressed and pushed her sacroiliac up. Um, this, so... And this took me a while to be able to treat because she had a lot of other things going on. And so I just did a lot of non-invasive treatment to begin with to get her to like respond to me. And I still haven't kind of got her, I've, I've been doing a lot of emotional stuff with her. So I haven't kind of physically treated her to the way I'd like to yet. But in saying that, you can see here that she's square. This was after a craniosacral treatment. She was square, and, but she still got her toes out, especially this left hind, and she would rest a lot, like all the time she'd be resting her one leg or the other leg. And then this one, um, her hind legs are now facing forward mm -hmm. instead of facing out. You can still see the, the difference in the development on the left and right side, like there's still a bit of a contraction up here and some weakness through this left Hind, um, like you can see the difference in the hamstring size through here. Um, and then the, the last one here was more recently. And um, sorry, I can't see. Yeah, and you can see that she's standing square. Um, you, we've still got this imbalance, and I, but I haven't done any real rehab with her. Like I've done handling and we walk over some poles once or twice a week, but um what's the not a lot because it's been too, too cold from left sorry right? like how old was she on the first one versus the last one um so the first one was when i a week after i got her so um that was in what are we in now that was in may april i think may april and then this one was uh, about a month later. And then this one was a week after that one. Oh, okay. And then this one was about two or three weeks after this one. So six weeks total? Yeah, probably. Yeah, six wow. to eight weeks. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, and there's still a lot of, and there's a lot of other changes she's had as well. Like she can now stand square in front, she wasn't, and her stern was back. And but then I looked at her yesterday and I'm like took some photos that I was going to put up, but she's not in a good place right now. So mm -hmm. she's obviously slipped in the mud again, and because everything hasn't established strongly yet, like we haven't got symmetry yet, it's not going to hold until I can get the same strength on both sides. Right. So uh, that's what we've got to work up to. And she had another fall, which I set her back one night when I went out and 
um, I could tell she'd slipped in the mud that night. Um, and so that set her back then as well. But I mean, so, still the point is how malleable they are at this stage. But if you get a hold of them at this stage, they're malleable enough that you can make significant change. And even if they do something, you can bounce them back. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and the sooner, like, I know that she's had that pelvic injury for probably a year, you know, so I'm already dealing with something that she's had for 12 months, as opposed to dealing with an injury where she just slips in the paddock and I treat it straight away. Right. So that, that definitely makes it harder the longer that you leave leave it if you can treat it straight away the better um but you know here she is as a foal and you can see how well built she was and how compact and how uh really nicely put together she was so this is what we're always aiming for to get back to you know because when you look at her here this is a week after i first got her i think or a bit maybe a bit longer, but you know, what you see here is you see the U-neck, you see the sternum forward, you see the forelimbs underneath her, her body, you see um, the left hind toe is a little bit turned out, you see the high head position, you see uh, the other thing she had was her back looked quite long when she came because she was really weak through her glute, middle gluteal tongue area because her pelvis wasn't working properly, you know, so now where she's standing much more underneath herself. I just couldn't get a good photo yesterday in the rain, but she's standing underneath herself. Um, her back isn't looking as long. She's looking, getting back to that more compact shape that she had. Um, and now it's a matter of building. And the other thing she had was really floppy, flaccid uh, quadriceps group. And now that's getting to a normal kind of muscle tension as well so you don't you want to check like do all the muscles look balanced because weak flossy weak flaccid quadriceps is not going to be good for stifle tracking right. so if you you know for good stifle tracking you want strong strong quadriceps um so these are kind of the areas that i'm working on um with her now and that's her doing the one pole challenge yesterday. <laughs> so that was her first day doing that. And um, it was a lesson in proprioception and mental focus. But when she got it, she actually walked the whole length of the pole. Cool. Which took me over three months to, um, to get for Patch to be able to do that. So wow. a mature horse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and then yeah, Henry's Henry's giving her the mental support. He's her he's her um best buddy. So you know that's what you get with continued. Uh, and when I say continued, I mean I'm doing one session a week sometimes of proprioception stuff. Um, but just teaching her to become more aware of her legs is so so important. Yeah, that's awesome. I you know this is great that you have Ellie May because I think that we'll be able to see. Uh, we'll come back and visit Ellie Mae every six months or so and see her yeah. progress and what you've been doing. It'd be really fun to follow her. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a new a new learning curve for me with a with a young horse and constantly thinking about how I can um, you know, optimize her like physically but mentally. That's the challenge. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'd like to acknowledge Ian Boothstrip because he's done a lot of work on um asymmetry and he does a lot of presentations on that as well so um and yeah he gave me a lot of information to increase my knowledge of asymmetry and in my presentations and stuff so i'd like to acknowledge him and then there's some references for you um of like dystochias and rib fractures and gastric ulcers in foals. And there's a lot more, I just picked out some bigger kind of studies um, to put in there. Great. So, um, oh yeah, Emma has a question about sure foot pads on foals. Yeah, we've, I haven't. We've done at least I haven't two webinars. Utilized them. Sorry? We've done two webinars on using sure foot with foals. I have someone, uh, Bess Miller, who's, 
she's raised over 250 foals. And so she has a couple right now that she's using Surefoot. Um, with two specifically that were that were uh, one was very sensitive and the other one she wasn't there for the birth um, and it's already been making a difference and she uses it in her training with her young foals. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that super valuable and I just haven't got to that point with Ali Mae yet, but that's like probably in the next week or two where I'll be doing some short foot pads with her because I really think that that will help her proprioception and limb awareness and balance and and all of that so yeah yeah abs absolutely <laughs> yeah and it um you know i obviously we don't have a i don't have a lot of data on using it with bulls but the data that i have has all been good um i worked yeah. a yearling a yearling um that really it made such a difference with her just in her handling and coming into the arena and stuff like that so um, they're yeah. the horses, you know, it's very short duration. It's, um, and a lot of times you're just kind of setting it up to make it part of what you're doing. Um, it's yeah, like, it's like the foals. It's a lot quicker, a lot shorter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is the whole, that's the young horse thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. Shorter, more specific um, sessions with lots of breaks and yep. let them have yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, I, I thought this would be shorter because I really didn't have that many slides, but I don't seem to be able to get it shorter. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's, um, if you just unshare your screen, I think we'll we'll wrap this up. But yeah, you know, it's such an important topic, and it's you know, for me, what I'm recognizing is how much things have. I haven't handled foals in a long time, but how much things have changed in terms of recognizing that if we want these horses to be uh, healthy and athletic and balanced in adulthood, we've got to start looking at them early because, yeah. you know, as you're showing with Ellie Mae, just how much, you know, the typical stuff that foals do can, can cause problems. And, uh, you know, the one horse that I keep thinking about during this is um, the story of the, it was a Pasifino and he had an accident in the field and they thought he was okay. And when they sent him to the trainer, clearly he must've had his ribs broken and he was a nightmare in training and it yeah. set him up for a lifetime of stress. Yeah. You know, and Surefoot's helped him, but he's my long hauler uh, in yeah. making change. Um, and had that been addressed at the time. Yeah, even if you think it's fine, like even if you think they're fine, they can, the young horses hide so much. And so I think regardless, just get them checked by a, you know, recognized practitioner. Yeah, you know, that that visit could set them up for a positive lifetime or not have the visit and have a lifetime of- And not understand why they're having so much difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this this was absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you back. Um, we're gonna come back again. And like I said, we really wanna follow up on Ellie Mae and see how she's doing. Um, yeah. I think it's so exciting to see what you're doing with her and it's great. So. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Tomorrow we're gonna have um, Danielle Santos talk about helmets and head injuries for people. Um, so tune into that one. It's just really important that we understand why we need to protect this thing. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Oh, somebody's asking how to find a practitioner that can work on foals. It's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it really depends where you are in the world. Yes. <laughs> um, that's, that's, I mean, in Australia, you know, we have AB, AB, the ABPA, so the Animal, um, oh, Animal Biomechanical uh, Professionals of Australia, so they can all uh, treat foals, um, and it's just finding, you know, a qualified, recognised practitioner oh. who's willing to treat foals, because, yeah, I, I can't help you over there, but I know there'd be a lot of qualified um, chiropractors. Foals are very different to treating adult horses. So I think it's important that you find someone who's used to working with foals. It's, it's yeah, really not the want, uh, low stress treatments. Absolutely. I, that is my most important thing in treating a foal is if I can't do everything I want to do, but they still had a positive experience and I'll just have to see them again. I would rather see them again than overload them and create a negative experience so 100 percent low stress is is the most important thing yeah so ask around i'm sure uh, you know the 
you might contact Dr. Kelleher at Marion DuPont Scott and see if she knows of someone um, because she's up there in Leesburg and um, she would know a lot of people. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Wendy. See ya.